good morning, everyone. It is a privilege to be able to come in here and um, be able to share with you this morning. If you don't know who I am, my name is Jennifer Enriquez, and I serve here on staff as the family and groups pastor. Oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to use that word in my director. Wow, oops. Um, uh, family groups director, and uh, as well as uh, event um, coordinator. I'm not going to lie, this morning um, kind of feels like I pulled the short straw in amongst the staff and a couple of elders, we say that when James has a difficult subject um, to preach on, he goes ahead and gives those sermons away. And um, since this morning, I actually think I can make a very good strong case for that. See, I get to talk about the gods of pleasure. Um, actually, it's not true. It's just the way the dates landed. But um, nonetheless, it's going to feel that way because I'm about to step on some toes because we're going to talk about food, entertainment, and sex. Yes, and as one of my favorite uh, Southern Texan preachers says, that if you can't say amen, you might need to say ouch. So go ahead and choose amongst those this morning over which you think you might be saying more. Um, and given what I have to share, I'm going to go ahead and pray first. So join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, um, thank you for this opportunity, for this glorious day that you've given us to come into your house and to worship, Lord, and to hear from you and your word and what it has to say about this thing known as idols and idolatry. And Lord, I pray right now that our hearts and our minds would be open to hear what you have to say and that we are willing to lean into the prompting of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to see the battle that needs to be fought within each of our hearts. And we just thank you for your presence here and ask for it to continue to be so. And we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Now, let's get something clear. Before I stand up here this morning and start talking about what I'm going to start to talk about, I need you to know I am not up here to attack you, berate you, make you feel horrible about these things, food, entertainment, and sex. Because the truth of the matter is, is that each and every one of these things are actually really good gifts from God. And he has given them to us to enjoy and to have as part of our life. But the problem is what we've done with them. Because the thing is, is that while each one of these things are good and wonderful gifts, maybe, just maybe, they've become competition or substitutes in our life. I don't know about you, um, but I don't like substitutes. I'm, I'm a little bit of a purist. See, I have this little thing known as lactose intolerance. Um, maybe some of you know what that is or kind of deal with it yourself. And I know this is going to be like TMI, Jennifer. We don't need to know about your, your dairy issues. But the thing is, is that um, I don't eat pizza like I once did because, well, it's just not worth it. Um, and ice cream is now a treat, even with my little lactate little pills that I swallow that they say is supposed to make it all better, which it really doesn't. Um, but I think the thing I kind of miss the most of all is a really good, satisfying bowl of cereal. I know it sounds silly, but my Trader Joe's, it has to be Trader Joe's, frosted flakes with milk. No, instead these days I have to have it with soy or almond or oat or flax, whatever my vegan husband happens to have in the fridge. And I just got to tell you, it's just not the same. See, the consistency is the same, the taste isn't the same, and I eat it, but I don't love it like I once did. See, the enemy is kind of does the same thing. He offers us these, these substitutes right here. And he takes them and he lures us away from the very one who actually gave it to us in the first place. And I think it's time that we actually get honest with ourselves and we start looking around at our society at whole and realize that these gods of pleasure are winning the war. And as a Christian, this should not be okay with you. And it is time for each one of us individually to start doing battle within our own hearts and wage a war against those gods. Because they are battling for our attention, they are battling for our time, for our adoration, and for our valuable resources. See, because we're allowing these little, these little G gods, these gifts, to get a place on the throne of our hearts that was actually only ever meant for one. 
Well, this morning, I'm going to ask you to, um, to grab your Bibles and get ready. We're going to be reading out of Ezekiel 1 this morning, and it's not going to be on the screen, so you actually do have to get your Bibles out or your smartphones. Go ahead and grab those. And then later on, we're going to be in Romans 1, so I'm even giving you a little where we're going. But before we do that, um, I actually want to read some definitions to you out of the official Homeschooling Dictionary of Homeschoolers Everywhere. It is the Webster's 1828. And um, I want to read to you those definitions and what uh, Noah Webster had to say about what they are. So well, let's start with idolatry. Idolatry is the worship of idols, images, or anything made by hands or which is not God. All right, we, we know what that is. We, we're pretty good. We, I think we all understand that one. Um, excessive attachment or veneration for anything or that which borders on adoration. Ooh, maybe that's the one we're not so familiar with, that borders on adoration. Well, let's actually look and understand what an actual idol is so we understand what it is when we're worshiping idols. So an idol is an image, form, or representation, usually of a man or other animal, consecrated as an object of worship, a pagan deity. That makes sense, that one we understand. Um, an image, okay. Uh, three, a person loved and honored to adoration. Oh, maybe that one we don't quite see quite as often or understand. Oh, you mean maybe like sports figures, actors, actresses, musicians? And then number four, anything on which we set our affections, that to which we indulge an excessive and sinful attachment, ouch. I think that's the one we might be dealing with when we start talking about the gods of pleasure. I know James got you all, you know, dealt with idols, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page in case you missed last week, didn't go on our YouTube channel that you all should be subscribed to, and uh, you didn't watch last week's. So we're getting us all on the same page because I need to make sure that you understand that an idol just isn't this created thing, th this image. I need you to know that it's more than just the things that you might see in temples that you would notice if you traveled the world or even here in the United States now or... Even the things you studied about, the ancient Greeks or the ancient Romans, we understand those idols, or the ones we read about in the Old Testament. I mean, Ezekiel, or excuse me, Exodus 32, um, Aaron was asked to make a golden calf for the people so they had something to worship. We understand that as an idol. 2 Kings 17 talks about the Israelites being um, exiled because of their idolatry. And how about the entire book of Hosea? I mean, that's an entire book that represents God's people choosing a mistress instead of God. So we get and we understand what those idols are as examples in scripture. Well, let's go ahead now and actually read from um, Ezekiel 14 this morning, and let's look at that, um, our passage of scripture. Number one, um, we're starting in verse one. Then certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, these men have taken their idols into their hearts and set the stumbling block of iniquity before their faces. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? Therefore, speak to them and say to them, thus says the Lord God, any one of the house of Israel who takes his idols into his heart and sets the stumbling block of his iniquity, his sin, before his face, and yet comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him as he comes with the multitude of his idols, that I may lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel who are estranged from me through their idols. You realize that, that those gods create a distance between them and God, an estrangement. Verse six, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent and turn away from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For any one of the house of Israel or of the stranger who sojourns in Israel, who separates himself from me, taking his idol into his heart and putting the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and yet comes to a prophet to consult me through him, I, the Lord, will answer him myself and I will set my face against that man. I will make him a sign and a byword and cut him off from the midst of my people, and you shall know that I am the Lord. You see, God's not messing around when it comes to idolatry, and he makes it quite clear the consequences that go with that. See, because our idols are actually a stumbling block. 
they are causing us to turn away. And the reason may be these gods of pleasure as they begin to take root in our hearts and our minds and, and we suffer consequences is because God's not in it. See, his blessing isn't there. And four different times, just in this passage alone, he brings up the fact that this is a heart issue. It's not the idol itself. It's not the statue. It's not the figure. It's not the thing. It's what's actually going on within the heart and where it's taken residency. See, because this throne was actually meant for God. And nowadays, I think it's actually becoming harder and harder for us to be able to spot and recognize idolatry. But Kyle Eidelman in his book, Gods at War, actually says, if you want to start to recognize where some of the idols are in your life, go ahead and start looking for the places where God is withholding his blessing. Ooh, ouch. See, his blessings are found in the things he calls us to and not the things he warns us away from. I want to say that one more time. His blessings are found in the things he calls us to and not the things he warns us away from. The gift of food. One proof that you can know for sure that the gift is actually, that food is actually a gift is the fact that you and I each have 10,000 taste buds all over our tongue. Isn't that amazing? 10,000. You know, God could have done something like just made all food taste the same. We could have given one source of nutrition and that would have been our, our, our food source, much like he did for the Israelites in the desert. But that's not what he did. 10,000 taste buds so that you could taste the sweetness of a strawberry and the tartness of a lemon and the spice of a pepper. Proof that food was meant to be enjoyed. But has it still become something that's a gift? Or has it become something that we live for? I've got some statistics for you this morning, and they're kind of, they're ouchy. I'm not going to lie. Let's go ahead and look up at the screen and some of these statistics. Please remember, I am just the, the messenger. Please don't shoot. Um, Americans spend more than $1 billion on fast food a year. In the last 30 years, obesity rates have doubled in adults, tripled in children and quadrupled in adolescents. We consume an average of 156 pounds of sugar every year. I think mine might be higher. Unhealthy diet contributes to approximately 678,000 deaths each year in the US due to nutrition and obesity related diseases. And this one, the restaurant revenue was set to reach $799 billion by the end of 2017. How about laughter and entertainment and joy and fun? It's creativity. It's a gift meant for us to enjoy. Need proof that um, God gave us this gift of entertainment? Just look around this room and all the different people in here. I'm not saying you're funny looking, at least not all of you. But the fact is, is that he gave some people the amazing talent to be able to sing. And to others, he gave the gift of wit. And to others, the boldness to stand up and act. Those are gifts. How about the first time that your child, your baby, laughed for the first time? Did you think you would literally just come out of your skin because it was the most precious thing you had ever heard? So entertainment, what's happened to it though? What have we done to it as a society and how have we elevated it? These statistics are rather shocking. In 2020, the entertainment and media market in the United States is expected to be worth over 720.38 billion US dollars. On a global scale, the entertainment and media market was worth 1.72 trillion US dollars in 2015 and it's actually set to rise to 2.14 trillion by 2020. That's next year, folks. The average American spends 4.5 hours a day watching television. I think that's a little low. Americans spend $36 billion on video games in 2017. 
1.57 billion YouTube users watch about 5 billion videos on, an, on average every single day. I am wondering how anything is ever getting done in this country. <laughs> and people spend an average of 35 minutes on Facebook each day. Eh, that might be debatable. I think that might be a little bit more. And while we've never been more entertained in our life, we're actually becoming more and more dissatisfied with life. We're overwhelmed with choices. We're discontent. Oh, did you actually know that the word bored or boredom um, did not appear until the early 1900s when the modern entertainment era that we're currently living in started around the industrial age? I, I actually looked. I was like, oh, it didn't appear until the 1900s. I'm going to look. I've got an 1828 dictionary. It's not in here. Bored or boredom is not in the dictionary until much later. Kind of interesting, huh? Okay. And then there's sex. One of God's most precious gifts. Don't believe it's a gift? Well, how about this? God could have made it very mechanical, and I'm not trying to be graphic when I'm talking. I'm just laying out the facts. Son, you can cover your ears if mommy's making you um, <laughs> uncomfortable. You should be used to it by now. Um, God could have said, let's mechanical, let's, get, let's do the job. Do what we need to do, reproduce, and let's move on. But no, that's not what it just does. It actually is pleasurable for those having sex within the bounds of marriage. But see, the enemy has taken this, oh, and the havoc he has wreaked with this. Look what society has done with this gift. These ones might make you cry. 22% of married men and 14% of married women have had at least one adulterous act in their life um, slash marriage. 35% of all internet downloads are porn related. 35%. Porn sites receive more traffic than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined each month. That one blew me away. Globally, porn is estimated to be a $97 a billion dollar industry with about 12 billion of that coming from the US. We're just looking for about five or six million dollars to upgrade our campus, so I'm just thinking there's some money out there to be had. In 2016 alone, more than 4,599 million hours of porn were consumed on the world's largest porn site. One site, just one. This isn't all of them together, this is just one. And that same world's largest porn site also received over 33,500 million site visits during 2018 alone. Wow. Have you ever been like sitting in a spot and uh, you're kind of sitting there and someone comes into your space and sits in your area? Or you're standing somewhere in line and it's kind of a space meant for one but somebody else decides to like crowd on in and, and, and push their way on into that space. Oh, and then they invite their friends to come over and stand by them too and suddenly a space for one is holding three, four, or five people. We love that, don't we? We love having our space invaded. No, we don't. See, there are choices to be made when our space starts getting invaded. We can actually be bold and we can speak up, kind of like what God did. Look back at verse 8 and what we read earlier. And I will set my face against that man and I will make him a sign and a byword and cut him off from the midst of my people and you shall know that I am the Lord. God doesn't hold back. He has something to say about it. As parents, we know what this is. This is, this is active wrath or punishment. This is us actively responding to a situation that we know needs to change. We do this with our kids. If they do something they shouldn't do, we punish them, we take something away, we make sure that they know that that wasn't okay. Maybe they miss out on a treat, miss out on an activity or an outing. Then there's the other option, and this is where I need you all to go to Romans 1 now. So if you have that spot where you had it marked in your Bibles, go ahead and turn there now to Romans 1. See, the other option of actually being bold and saying something is where you just kind of maybe walk away. So go with me now down to verse 21 of Romans, where it says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. 
Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And here it comes. Verse 24, therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. This is passive punishment where you kind of just let them experience the consequences. You know, like when you see your kid not studying for a test and you really want to just punish them for not studying, but instead you let them suffer and get the bad grade and what goes along with that. Or we see them making poor choices in their relationships and you know that they're going to get their heart hurt and yet you know they're just not going to listen so you let them have their way. God sometimes does that with us as well. See, we're asking little God sometimes to do the same thing and share a place in our heart that was really only meant for God. And he's a gentleman, and if you want that space, sometimes he's going to give it to you. But I just don't think we're often ready for the consequences that comes with that. See, because gifts are actually meant to be savored and enjoyed, but they can become tyrants over us, and we become their slaves. Because a tyrant doesn't give, a tyrant simply takes. And in the end, he actually ends up demanding more and more and more. See, when food becomes our solace, and the thing that we uh, kind of say that we, well, I deserved it, I earn it. Do you realize we actually end up denying Jesus the joy that he wants in satisfying us as the bread of life? He even called himself that. See, he was actually meant to be our comforter, not food. But we say, I I mean, I deserve this. I earned this. I mean, it's Friday. I've been good all week. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to have a piece of chocolate cake. I'm going to have a chocolate cake. I'm guilty of this all the time. And not just on Fridays. Unfortunately, it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You know, food is actually tied to family in a very strong way and tied to our culture. And because of that, it's also tied with emotional strings as well. And we've often adopted the gods of our family and our heritage. And so with that, we adopt the attitudes and the habits. And before we think that, oh, gods of food only apply to those people that are struggling with their weight, that need to lose weight, oh, no, 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 no. Looks are deceiving. Don't think that those people who um, are just struggling with what goes in their mouth, some are actually obsessing with what they keep out, and they've become a slave to their food, and rather having it as a gift, they've denied themselves those gifts. Because at one time, We ate to live, and now we live to eat. So, has the God of food become a problem for you? Has it ceased being a gift and now become something that you live for? You know, King Solomon was one of the wisest men. Scripture calls him the wisest king ever, and Talk about entertainment. There was nothing this man couldn't do. He had the resources, the ability. He had it all, and he created all these amazing places and things for him to enjoy and to be comforted and to enjoy those pleasures. He probably was considered the Walt Disney of his time. But in the end, he actually um, came to the conclusion, Ecclesiastics 1-2 says that it was all meaningless. But is there a place in our lives for us to have pleasure and entertainment and relax? Of course there is. We're called to Sabbath. But does the entertainment that you take in fill a void or does it actually create one? See, once again, rather than, ta- rather than giving, it actually ends up taking. It takes our time, it takes our attention, our resources, I love what Eidelman said in his book about wondering whether or not entertainment is one of your gods. He said to check your calendar and to check your bank book. Ouch. See, am I actually looking more forward to the next Marvel movie coming out 
than I am to coming to church on Sunday? Maybe. Am I simply just amusing myself to death because I'm worshiping my own comfort and pleasure and I have forgotten what 1 Timothy 6 talks about when it says that God richly provides us with everything to enjoy? How is it sometimes that we'll actually say, will you pray for me to have more time in the word and and I can have more time to pray and yet we've just finished binge watching our our, our third show this month And we're scrolling through Instagram for our 10th time today, and yet we still don't wonder why we don't have time to pray. I think instead that what we ask people to pray for us and pray for ourselves is instead that God would say, Lord, turn my heart back to you and not these things. So has the God of entertainment ceased being a gift and now become something that instead that you live for? And then let's not leave out sex. We're in a society now where anything goes. Does it make you feel good? Is it what you want? Does it make you happy? By all means, have at it. We won't judge you. It's all yours. And we forget the consequences that go with it. See, sex was meant to be um, shared within the bounds of marriage and to be shared with a spouse as an expression of intimacy. Emotionally, it actually mirrors the intimacy that we're intended to share with God himself. So it actually makes perfect sense that the prince of this world would take that ideal picture of intimacy and do everything he can to twist it, destroy it. See, when we rob the gift of sex as the emotional component of it, it reduces it to just a physical act. And as for pornography, it actually takes its viewer hostage demanding that they engage more, watch longer, so that they could have the same outcome. And it then actually, besides that, steals more when they are actually physically intimate with a partner, it actually decreases satisfaction, drive, abilities, because it desensitizes the individual. It empties bank accounts in an attempt to feed the need because they need to feel more. And the sad part is it actually isolates that worshiper of the God of sex. And in the end, it'll demand your marriage, it'll demand your family, and quite possibly, it'll call for your career on its altar. Is this only something that the unmarried struggle with, happily faithful in their marriages? No way. The God of sex can be an issue in a happily married couple as well because there becomes the issue of quantity, quality, satisfaction, comparison. And that gift can get just as twisted in a married couple as well. It has sadly been the downfall of so many Christian men and Christian women. I think what comes with it is this cloud of shame that kind of covers it as well. And it makes it so difficult for you to actually sense the presence of God in your life, because you can't see through that cloud. So what a tragedy is that one of his greatest gifts ceases being a gift, and it actually becomes what people live for. The more intensely that we actually chase after pleasure, the less likely we are to actually catch it. It would seem that the harder you work for it, the easier it would be to get to it, right? If I put in enough effort toward it, I'm going to get this thing that I want. Well, the story in 2 Samuel 13, and you can flip over in there, and while you're flipping to 2 Samuel or pushing buttons to 2 Samuel 13, this is the story of Amnon and Tamar, and I just want to summarize it because we're not going to read the whole thing, but please read the whole thing tonight. This is literally a movie. If you think Hollywood has great ideas for story and plot lines, you actually ought to see some of the real stuff that goes on. Let me just kind of catch you up. Two of King David's sons, um, Absalom and Amnon. Now, Absalom, different mothers, so they're not um, full brothers, they're only half. Absalom has a beautiful sister, Tamar. She's gorgeous. So beautiful, in fact, that it is said that Amnon, her half-brother, is tormented, the word tormented is used there, by his desire for his virgin sister. Here's the kicker. 
Amnon has a friend that actually gets in cahoots with him and comes up with a plan so that Amnon can actually have Tamar. And it works. And she's there and in his chamber. And at the time, she is begging. She is pleading with him, please don't do this thing. Don't you know that our father, the king, there is nothing that he won't withhold from you if you just ask him. But he won't listen. And despite her pleading, he rapes her. Will you look at verse 15 with me and let's, and let's read that together. Then Amnon hated her with very great hatred, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, get up, go. He got what he wanted. He took it, but instead it just left him empty. And worse yet, he loved her so deeply, was so tormented that he believed that he had to have her and couldn't live without her. He then gets it. That must have been like a deep love, right? but his hatred was worse than what it drove him to? You know, their story doesn't end there. Keep reading to the end and see how this goes. And it doesn't end pretty because when we bow down at the foot of these gods, it doesn't end pretty. (coughs) See, we chase after these things and they leave us empty. They crowd and they smother up the space that was meant for God. He's in there somewhere. And like Romans 1 had told us, we end up being given up to the lusts of our heart. Idolatry is a heart issue. So wait a minute, this is all, this is so sad, Jennifer, is there a way out of all this stuff? Can we have these things? Yeah, but they just can't have a place in our lives that way. We can't put them on the throne. They can't earn our adoration. They don't get first place in our thoughts and in our actions and in our conversations. See, we need to take them off the throne and put them back where they belong and remember that they're actually gifts for us to enjoy. Thankfully, Scripture actually speaks to the hope about the heart work that God wants to do in us. Look with me. On the screen, the verses will be with there. Excuse me. Jeremiah 24, 7 says, I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. God gives us a heart to know him. He wants to be the thing that fills your whole heart and takes up the whole place of the throne. Joel 2.13 says, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Not your clothes, the tearing of the clothes, an outward sign. It's the heart that needs to be broken. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Wow. He's gracious. While you're doing battle with these things that might have become gods in your life, he's patient with you. Oh, thank goodness. And then 1 Corinthians 10, 13 through 14. And I know you all know this verse, at least the first one really well. No temptation has overtaken you (coughs) that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. So many times I think we read to verse 13 and we don't keep going. See, the things that are going on in 13 and verse 13, he's talking about the idols we've set up. He's talking about those things that we worship and put above him. But then in the end he says, I'm gonna give you what you need. I will help you have weapons to be able to fight this. You also gotta run. We don't battle these things alone. We have these weapons. And look around you. You have an entire church family. The people that you do life with, come to church with, you're in community groups with, that will help you battle these things and will come alongside you. Some of us know exactly which one of these idols are yours, or maybe they're all three. 
and you cringed kind of the whole time I've been talking because the Holy Spirit's kind of been tap tapping on your shoulder and making you aware of some of these things. Then there are others of you just that went la 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 la. I can't hear a thing you're saying. Oh, because it's just a little too hard, it's a little too painful because you like your gods. You like the life you lead and you don't want to change it. Some of us need to actually invite God in and let him shine a light in our hearts and in our minds and start doing some of the hard work of asking him to reveal some of those things in your life that you're dealing with and those gods that you need to battle. Does this next week actually need to be a week of fasting for you? Maybe you need to fast from food this week. I've spent the last week fasting from sugar. Ooh, rough week. Maybe it's not just sugar for you. Maybe it's snacking. Maybe it's food in general. Maybe you need to take a media and Netflix fast and not participate in those things over the next week. Maybe the internet needs to be for work this week and work alone, and that's it. Maybe as a married husband and wife, you need to fast from the physical act of sex and instead take that time to come together and to pray. The other thing I would highly encourage you to do is to have a trusted confidant, someone you trust, someone close to you that knows your life, knows how you spend your time and your days and knows your habits, that you'd be willing to say, I need you to help me see some of these things I may not be aware of and those blind spots regarding food, entertainment, and sex. Quite possibly, there are somebody in this room, you're like, I don't deal with any of those things. Don't worry, we've got plenty of God still coming in the rest of this series. We're gonna talk about the God of romance and the God of our friend relationships and family relationships. Oh, and success is coming. You know, money, power, all those things. So we'll get to your God if these aren't yours. But maybe there's someone here in this room that it's not just surrendering and giving up these gods, you actually need to surrender to God for the first time. And around here we say it's as easy as A, B, C. Admit. Admit that you've screwed up and that you've got gods on your throne instead of God. And that you need to believe. Believe that Jesus did something for you that you could not do for yourself. And then choose. Choose to follow him. Choose to make him Lord over your life. Choose to let him sit here instead of those things. I'm hoping that this next week as it goes by and you take the time to fast, I hope you realize that you're not okay with substitutes in your life, that you don't want just the fake stuff anymore, that you realize these things will never satisfy you the way this will. And I hope you're actually ready for the real thing. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word that does pierce into our hearts, Lord, and thank you for the Holy Spirit that can prompt us in ways um, that we need, that we need to hear some of the hard stuff. And I'm so grateful to be in a church where we can talk about these difficult things and not shy away from them. And Lord, I pray as those that will make the decision to enter into a time of fasting this week, that they will, um, they will do that and you will walk beside them and help them see what it is that they have been dealing with or the battles that they need to fight with certain gods in their life. So we just thank you for this time this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen.